I mean, just a, a brutal morning in Tiger Stadium on Saturday. LSU falls to Tennessee 40-13 in Baton Rouge. The worst loss of Brian Kelly's FBS coaching career. So the question remains, is that what LSU is? Is that what we as LSU fans have to look forward to throughout the rest of October? Or is Brian Kelly and the rest of this team going to look at the mistakes that they made against Tennessee and build upon them? That's the big question moving forward throughout the rest of LSU's schedule. And we'll get to that on today's edition of Locked on LSU. You are Locked on LSU, your daily podcast on the LSU Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Well, thank you for making Locked On LSU your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts, Spotify, Apple Music, you name it. You can find us there. Or also on YouTube as well. Just search Locked on LSU, hit that subscribe button, and you'll get notified as soon as Locked on LSU drops. And of course, we are part of the Locked on Network, your team every day. So let's get into it. Because LSU suffered an incredibly brutal, just embarrassing loss at home to Tennessee. And I was sitting in the Tennessee section because I was going, I went with my parents who are Tennessee grads and a bunch of my family friends who all went to Tennessee. And I was the only person standing in that section wearing a tiger print dress, you know, and I'm the only person that's an LSU fan in that section. And I'm there throughout the entire game, all four quarters. And I'm standing there in the middle of a bunch of Tennessee fans screaming it's great to be a Tennessee Vol and singing Rocky Top and I'm standing there absolutely positively miserable (laughs) lonely and sad after just a a bad game from LSU all the way around a bad game by the coaching staff a bad game because it looked like that team just wasn't necessarily prepared for what Tennessee had to throw at them And that Tennessee, on the other hand, looked very prepared to stop whatever LSU was going to throw at them. This was a team that made some pretty sloppy mistakes, dropped passes, and we'll get into all all the nitty-gritty of that, but dropped passes, missed tackles. Um, It was, this is a game that I look at and I say, there are a lot of people who who are culpable in this. And there are a lot of things that you can point to to say, okay, well, that's when things went wrong. That's when things went south. That's when things went awry. That's when the game really got out of LSU's hands. But overall, I want to, I want to get into the three things that I liked and the three things that I didn't like. I do that every Monday. So I want to get into that. And I want to get into the nitty gritty of the game. But before I do that, I kind of just want to have a check-in with everybody because I feel like I've seen so much commentary on Twitter and through the grapevine, just through LSU fans, um, incredibly defeated after that game. And I understand because I feel that way too. I just feel like, man, LSU had such a a fun winning streak going there, 2-0 in the SEC. I think we were getting excited about what we had seen. But I also wanted to be really real with y'all week in and week out that while that Mississippi State win and an Auburn win and two big marquee wins against New Mexico and in Southern, albeit lower level opponents, still, you know, exciting and fun to see this team try and start to figure themselves out and puts up some big numbers up. But I, I also wanted to highlight after the Mississippi State and Auburn games and even some of the mistakes that we saw after New Mexico and Southern, I said, hey, those are going to be mistakes that are may not have been costly against a New Mexico team or an Auburn team that turned the ball over four times, those mistakes might not be costly in this game, in this instance, but these mistakes will be costly in the month of October, whenever you're going back to back to back to back to back against really good top 25 SEC, SEC ranked opponents. And that's the, that's the truth. And I think the reality of it is that we've through those, those, these past four weeks, you know, excluding the Tennessee game, but from Southern to Mississippi State to New Mexico to Auburn, we've experienced a lot of fun with LSU football, be it, you know, a lot of nail biting and a lot of nerves against Auburn. Four wins, 2-0 in the SEC, 4-1 on the season. And LSU just got really humbled 
And they did it at home against a really good Tennessee team. And that's that's the reality of it. Is that going into this season, I didn't, you probably didn't, or at least you shouldn't have expected all sunshine and rainbows. This was a program that was left in really bad shape. This was a program that had 39 scholarship players for a bowl game. That's bad. This is a program that pretty much completely cleaned house. Not completely, but pretty darn close to it. New coaching staff, new new scheme, new quarterback, several, several transfer players. And I think the theme for myself, both in fall camp and throughout these last five weeks, is for LSU to try and figure out its identity. And for LSU to try and do that as much as they could getting into this tough stretch. And I don't think LSU's really found their identity yet. I don't think you really find your identity through six weeks. I don't think Brian Kelly is going to be able to put his fingerprint on a, on a program, on a team through six games. It just doesn't work like that. That's why we always look at first year head coaches with a grain of salt. That's why I don't really make up my mind about a coach until about year two. You're looking at a few coaches in their second year. Josh Heupel seems to be passing that test with flying colors. Shane Beamer, on the other hand, in year two, he doesn't seem like he's going to be passing that test. So year two is the big one. Year two is when you can really start to make these assumptions about the direction of which, in which the program is going. Do you see an upward trajectory? Do you start to see some improvement? Year one, at this point, Year one is damage control. That's what this Brian Kelly coaching staff and he himself is trying to do. Damage control from what was left from the previous coaching staff. Let's try and pick up as many pieces as we possibly can. Let's try and add as many solid pieces as we possibly can. And let's try and make them all fit together. And hey, while we're at it, let's do it in the most difficult conference in college football. And let's try and figure everything out within a few weeks. It doesn't work like that. Brian Kelly told us going into that Auburn game, we're going to have some really good days. We're going to have some really bad days in this stretch. We knew that. I knew that. You knew that. You could have all your, you know, your preseason expectations and hopes that you want, but understanding that Brian Kelly is in his first year and he had a really difficult undertaking in this first year. Unless you have some really good players. But LSU was also left pretty thin in a lot of position groups. And looking, you know, more closely at this game, without your starting left tackle, 12 hours before kickoff. Well, that puts you at a disadvantage. This team has a, a lot, a lot of improvements to make. That Tennessee game highlighted that. This team has a lot of improvements that it needs to make. It has a lot of holes that need to be filled. Tennessee's a really good team. Tennessee is playing Alabama this weekend, and there's a whole lot of chatter about a potential upset. And we'll get into all of that later on this week. Tennessee's a really good team. LSU is a team that's trying to figure itself out. LSU is a team that's trying to figure out its identity. LSU is a team that's trying to figure out, I mean, what do we have and how do we use it? So while I do think that this LSU team is going to be able to turn things around, what we saw in Tiger Stadium on Saturday, that's not, that's not a definition of this team. Wouldn't be surprised if they go to the Swamp and beat Florida. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if they could potentially pull off an upset against an Ole Miss team, a top 10 Ole Miss team at that. I wouldn't be surprised. You know, this, this is an LSU team that has a lot of talent on it, and it shows a lot of flashes of really good things. But it's also an LSU team that just played a really bad game. And everything that could have gone wrong, honestly, came pretty close to it. And this Tennessee team is too good to make those kinds of mistakes against. So this is not a bad team. It was simply a bad game. Brian Kelly was not a bad hire. At least I'm not going to say that yet. He just coached a bad game. This isn't a bad program. It just needs some time to heal. This isn't a, this isn't bad. It was a bad day. It was a bad game. There were some bad play calls. There were some bad decisions by the coaching staff and the players alike. It was a bad day on Saturday. 
but we expected some bad days going into this year, right? We didn't want them to happen. I didn't want to acknowledge it. I didn't want to come to terms with the fact that we would actually have to swallow the fact that we would have some bad days, but that's the reality of a first-year coaching staff. That's the reality of growing pains. That's the reality of having a program that was left barren. You have to build it back up. Saturday was a growing pain. That's simply what it was. But coming up next, I want to get into the three things that I didn't like. We'll end on the three things that I did like. Coming up next, I want to get into the three things that I didn't like. But before we do that, I want to tell you about Simply Safe. So it's crazy because 4 million people have chosen Simply Safe Home Security to protect their home. And that's crazy because you can see just how much it works and just how much people trust Simply Safe to take care of their homes and their families, so on and so forth. And you don't earn the trust of that many people without doing something right. So at Simply Safe, they truly believe in your safety. That's the only thing that matters to them is your safety to make sure that you can go to bed at night feeling protected. And I use Simply Safe at my own house. I they and I feel so much better, you know, coming home late at night or going to sleep at night knowing that Simply Safe has got my back. They've got cutting edge security technology powered by 24/7 professional monitoring agents who always have got you covered. And here's why I love it. Like I said, when I come home late at night or, you know, early in the morning or when I go to sleep at night, I live in a really busy area of a, of a really poppin' city. So sometimes it can be a little bit scary, but not with Simply Safe, because I know that Simply Safe has worked overtime and will continue to work overtime to make sure that I am protected and to make sure that my house will not be broken into because it's got the effectiveness of the technology that will make you feel extra supported by Simply Safe. It, it's super advanced technology. They've you know, you can control the system from your phone. So when I come home, you know, I can make sure that it's activated or, you know, if I'm out and about and I forget if I, you know, activated my system, I can just do it from my phone. It's super easy. I can watch and check in on my house on the live stream of security cameras. And there's a bunch of high tech sensors. So it'll cover the front door, the back door, the backyard, any area of your home. And you can check it on your phone, which is great technology. And it's super, super simple and easy to use. They've got 24-7 professional monitoring. So if they see that there might be a threat or they might see something that looks a little bit fishy, the Simply Safe agents will call you and let you know, hey, do we need to send a police officer? Hey, is everything okay? Just letting you know what's going on in your house. And they will take care of all of that for you. So you can customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com slash locked on college. Save 20% on your Simply Safe security system when you sign up for an interactive monitoring plan and get your first month free. Visit simplysafe.com slash locked on college to learn more. There is no safe like Simply Safe. Well, thank you for making Locked on LSU your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Also check us out on YouTube as well. Locked on LSU on YouTube. So the three things that I didn't like in LSU's 40 to 13 loss to Tennessee, honestly, there was a lot to pick out that I I didn't like, but I'll start first and foremost with, uh, with special teams, because this is something that I'm sick and tired of talking about. I am sick and tired of talking about another special teams blunder about special teams, making adjustments in personnel, and it's still not working out. LSU ranks at the very bottom of the SEC in special teams efficiency. And that stat should not come at any sort of surprise for you because any sort of special teams mistake or blunder that could potentially happen, literally, I think that any special teams mistake that you could make in, in, in football, you know, look at the rule book. And if there's a chapter called things you can mess up on special teams, LSU's probably done all of those things so far this season. Yikes. Not good. Muffed kickoff against Tennessee. Which, who muffs a kickoff? Who drops a kick? Handed Tennessee seven points. Because they recovered that ball. Right into the end zone. You're already down seven nothing. And I understand Brian Kelly's thought process here. Give Tennessee fewer, you know, fewer possessions, get on the board early. He always talks about, you know, coming out and starting early. Now, I understand how important that is. I talk about that all the time. I just don't know if I necessarily agree. I No, I don't agree 
with the decision to defer Be- or to not defer. Because what has LSU shown us so so far through this season? Second half team against Florida State, fourth quarter. That's when things started to click. Mississippi State came out in the second half. That offense was electric. Auburn, same thing. Down 17 nothing, and they were able to dig themselves out of a hole in you know the later part of the second quarter in the second half. LSU needs time to find its groove. So it makes sense to me, seeing the themes of this team, go ahead, you know, give Tennessee that possession. Do they score there? Probably, because they've scored, I believe, on every single opening possession so far. But that means that LSU gets the first possession in the third quarter. Second half team. It's a team that's proven in the second half. Doesn't matter, you know, how down bad they might be. They can come back very electrically in the second half. I would prefer if LSU had the first possession in the second half rather than in the first. And it's easy to say that since it didn't work out. It's easy to say that since it blew up in Brian Kelly's face, that decision. But just thinking about how this team has has been so far this year, to me, I would say go ahead and defer. Trust your defense. Let Tennessee have the ball first. You get the ball first in the second half in the third quarter, which is where you played your best football. So I, I didn't agree with that. And But overall, I didn't agree with the decision. But overall, that's on Jack Bash. I mean, I, I, I can't, you know, necessarily attack Brian Kelly for that. I can criticize his decision. But Jack Bash muffing that, that kickoff and dropping that kick, that's on Jack Bash. He needs to catch that. And we know Jack Bash can do that. He's a super sure-handed wide receiver. He's a good player. He's a great player. But he just dropped that kickoff. You can't do that. You can't make mistakes like that. I always say, give me the gimmies. They didn't take a gimme. They actually gave Tennessee a gimme. Tennessee had a 58-yard punt return. Gave him a field goal. Set him up in perfect field goal position. So now, because of your two special teams mistakes, or, or special teams um, ineptitudes, I guess, Tennessee's up 10 nothing. all in the LSU special teams. Now, I don't like to call four drops, especially when you are in your first year and we are through six weeks. These coaches have families. They have bills to pay. I understand that. I don't like to call for jobs. But I'm looking at Brian Polian, and I'm saying, what are you doing to help the, the special teams? What are you doing to help the team? Because so far, special teams has done nothing but hurt this LSU team. So I'm looking at Brian Polian and I'm thinking, what are you going to do to change that? What are you going to do to fix that? Because through weeks, through six weeks, he hasn't. And that's on the coaching staff. Dropping the kickoff, that's on Jack Bash. Yelling at him to get to the other side of the end zone, that's on Brian Kelly and 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 uh and pull and Brian Polian. So I I need more from Brian Polian. I need more from these special teams. I need LSU to not hand the top offense in the country 10 points on a silver platter. Second thing I didn't like uh, was some of the decisions to go forward on fourth down. Now, again, I understand the aggressive mindset from Brian Kelly. I understand not wanting to give Tennessee possessions. And I understand you wanting to hold on to the football as long as you possibly can. I understand that you're not going to beat Tennessee by simply kicking field goals. You're going to have to score touchdowns. I understand all of that. I understand the thought process, but I don't agree with all of his decisions to go for it on fourth down. The first one was in the first quarter. Tennessee's leading 10, nothing after you gave him a, a, a touchdown after that, that muff kickoff. And they gave up a 58 yard punt return to set him up in field goal territory. So Tennessee's leading 10, nothing. Um, LSU's at the fourth, uh, at fourth and four at the Tennessee 14. I don't know if I necessarily like this one. I, I see as kind of a 50, 50, um, you know, you don't get it. And Tennessee's not in great field position. Um, but it's, a, it's, uh, the play call is what I don't agree with here. It was a short pass to Kayshawn Booty short of the sticks. He, you know, he's running up to, uh, to the down marker, reaches his hand out, doesn't get it one yard short of the sticks and now Tennessee has the ball um, at their own 14. So 
I don't agree with the play call necessarily here. You need to get that ball past the sticks. You need, and I don't know if that was, you know, if that was Jaden Daniels throwing it short of the sticks. I don't know if that was the play call that was short of the sticks. Either way, the execution of that, I don't, I don't love. But going forward at fourth and four, when you're at Tennessee's 14, I probably would have preferred to just kick a field goal there. Now it's a one score game. Fourth and four is a little iffy when you haven't really been able to get things moving offensively. So I probably I would have kicked a field goal here. 10 3 is not the end of the world. 10 nothing with Tennessee with the ball back. Now that is, you're getting really close to the end of the world. Now, this second one, I really didn't hate it. It was fourth and one at the LSU 46. Um Going for it on fourth and one, like that, that is a, a that is a first down that you should get. You should be able to just fall down and get a first down. Um, but also, see the, the other side of that is, you know, you don't convert. And now Tennessee's in LSU territory, so I understand not wanting to to give Tennessee the ball when you're so close to a first down. But also, you don't want to give Tennessee any more yardage than they already can get for themselves. You don't want to hand them any more opportunities that you've already handed them. Of course, LSU doesn't get it. They don't convert. They get stopped short. And it's a Hen and Hooker 45 yard touchdown pass. Tennessee's up 20 to nothing. So there you go. That is 10 points on special teams that you've given Tennessee. And that's another touchdown that you gave them because of uh, failing to convert on fourth down. And this third one is the worst. This third one is just simple coaching malpractice. Fourth and 10, you're at about midfield. LSU's down 20 to seven. And they go for it. Jaden Daniels is sacked. I don't believe they gained any yards on that play. Field goal, Tennessee. LSU is down 23 to seven. That's when the game started getting out of hand. Because here... If you're able to score on this possession, 20, you know, 20 to 14, that's a very much so a ball game. 20 to three to seven is not. Fourth and 10. And you're giving Tennessee almost 50 yards. You're not going to convert a fourth and 10. Kick a field goal where you can. Just surrender where you can. Have trust in your defense. This defense has undoubtedly been the brightest spot for LSU this year. The defense won the Auburn game. The defense was able to do things to Mississippi State that I haven't seen a single SEC team do yet. This defense is really good. So I wanted to see Brian Kelly trust the defense a little bit more. Yes, giving this Tennessee offense more possessions and more opportunities. Might come back and bite you in the butt because that's just how good this offense is. But I'm looking at it like, look, I got a good defense. Maybe we can, if they can get a stop, they can force a three and out for Tennessee, then you got the ball back and it's in much better position. So I just, I didn't agree with all of these decisions to go forward on fourth down and LSU goes 0 for 3 on converting for fourth downs. At some point, something's got to give. At some point, you just got to abandon whatever the analytics tell you and just use your brain and say, this just doesn't make sense. We haven't been able to gain big yardage very much so far this game. So what makes me think I'm going to be able to convert in fourth and 10? I just didn't agree with that. And then the third thing that I didn't like, and this is a very, very broad statement, but I think that LSU just didn't seem to have answers overall, offensively and defensively. Tennessee's defense continued to bring pressure on Jaden Daniels. He was sacked five times. And I know that, you know, I I don't want to call the offensive line something that I didn't like because with the Will Campbell situation late on Friday night and then Garrett Dellinger leaving in the middle of the game, him dealing with, you know, his injury, his own injury problems, this offensive line has been, you know, ripped up and rearranged and changed so many times throughout the season. I don't think it's fair for me to say, you know, look at all of these backups or look at these players that are playing in different positions that are in, they're not used to, to playing with other players in different positions that they just haven't built chemistry with and say, Hey, go protect Jaden Daniels and be flawless by doing it. Um, was the, was the pass protection a problem? Yes. Is the offensive line continuing to be a problem? Yes. Um, that's both on the health of the offensive line and the inconsistency of the offensive line. But it just seemed like, 
this LSU offense didn't have any answers to the Tennessee pass rush. It seemed like, you know, this LSU run game didn't have any answers to Tennessee continuously stopping the run. It seemed like this LSU defense, albeit I believe, you know, in the first quarter, maybe even the first half, honestly, this LSU defense wasn't playing poorly. They were able to get some stops. The tackling is still kind of is still an issue. They weren't able to stop the run. Tennessee ran for like 250 yards. That's a problem. It seemed like whatever Tennessee threw at LSU, offensively or defensively, they just didn't seem to have much of an answer. Or they didn't seem to have as bold of an answer. And this is all like a very broad statement about the game. I mean, I can get into the nitty gritty of, you know, the the pass protection on Jaden Daniels at third and seven. I can get into that. But overall, just watching that game, that's just the overall vibe is, are you going to be able to come back here? Are you going to be able to make adjustments at the half? Are you going to make adjust- in-game adjustments at some point? Are you going to try and figure out, you know, how to get things moving on the ground? I can figure out how to stop this Tennessee rush running game. That was kind of my question was, where is the answer? Where are the adjustments? It just didn't seem like LSU had any of those for Tennessee on Saturday, entire stadium. Um, but three things I didn't like, special teams, the uh, decisions on fourth down, um, and the fact that LSU just didn't have answers. And I think all of those things, you know, you can tie them all up in a nice pretty bow and I look to coaching to be the number one issue for LSU on Saturday. You know, you can look at it and say, hey, you know, Tennessee's a good team. LSU's got some work to do, absolutely. But I I don't think this game should have been a blowout. Vegas didn't think this game should have been a blowout. Credit to Tennessee. They're a good team, but so is LSU. That game should not have been as lopsided as it was. And I look to coaching for being the biggest reason because of that. But coming up next, I usually do the three things I do like, This week, I only had two. So I'll do the two things that I did like from LSU on Saturday, because even in a loss, you can find some good things. But before we do that, I want to tell you about betonline.net because it is your number one source for football betting info this season. You can find the latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, and in-depth articles and analysis, analysis on any game that you can find. And as always, BetOnline remains your continued source for all of your sport wagering information. They've got live betting and up-to-the-minute scores for every sport out there. It's the fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your games and events. They've got MLB, MMA, boxing, and golf. We're getting into the nitty-gritty of uh, baseball MLB playoffs, so that's been a really fun thing to bet on. So head to BetOnline.net or using mobile device to learn more. BetOnline, where the game starts. So the two things, and I'll do three things. Um, it's just two things today. Um, three things that I did like. Two things that I did like. First and foremost, um, I like that Jaden Daniels was throwing the ball more. I know a lot of LSU fans have issues with Jaden Daniels, rightfully so. He is the starting quarterback, and LSU got blown out. There are two people that you blame for that: the coach and the quarterback. So I, I, I don't blame you for looking to Jaden Daniels and, and saying, you know, he's part of the reason why. But he threw for 300 yards, a touchdown and an interception. I talked about this last week. If you're going to want, if you're going to say LSU needs to throw the ball more, then you're going to have to admit the fact that he's probably going to throw more interceptions. That's part of growing this passing game. Um, but he hasn't thrown for 300 yards since November of 2019 when he was a freshman at Arizona State. And that was, uh, he threw for 408 yards against Oregon in that game. And he had a few 300-yard games in the 2019 season, but that was the last time that he did it. So Jaden Daniels did something on Saturday that he he has not done in a very long time. And you could look at that and say, okay, well, LSU was down the entire game, so of course they were throwing the ball. Yes, I I understand that. I I know that. But it was good to see Jaden Daniels throw the ball. And did he look uncomfortable doing it? Yeah, he did sometimes. Sometimes he dropped back and, you know, he, he missed reads. Sometimes he missed open tar- wide open targets downfield. Sometimes he just didn't throw to the open targets downfield. Sometimes that was on Jaden Daniels. Sometimes that was on the pass catchers. I mean, Dre Jenkins just dropped an easy ball that hit him right in the hands. LSU was down 20 to seven. He catches that ball. I mean, he had an open lane for the end zone. Now it's 2014. Now it's a ball game. Kayshawn Booty had dropped a ball that hit him right in the face. 
you can't drop those balls. When you're two senior, you know, not actual seniors, but, you know, senior presences on this team, experienced players on this team, near the best players on this team, you have to make those plays. Your star players have to make star plays. And asking Kayshawn Booty to, you know, catch a 15-yard pass, whatever it was, it's not asking him to do too much. So, you know, all of that being said, I did like the fact that Jaden Daniels was throwing the ball more because he's going to have to throw the ball more throughout this really difficult stretch that LSU is looking at. You know, it was the passing game of all things. I think we can maybe look at it and say maybe so. Maybe Saturday was the beginning of, you know, a, a newfound passing game. I don't know. Um, but I, I embrace it, and I like to see that. And also Tennessee was stopping the run. Um, so Jaden Daniels didn't really have a choice but to throw the ball because LSU was not getting anything done um, on the ground. But also the second thing that I did like um, was the accountability from Brian Kelly. As I just said, I looked to coaching to being the biggest issue for LSU on Saturday. He said in his press conference, in his opening statement, I need to be better at coaching. Look, I could stand up here all day. Th- th- that falls on coaching. And that that's on me, um, and and I have to coach better. Uh, we've got to coach better. We've got to coach our team better. Um, that's the group we have, um, and we've got to coach them better. And congratulations to Tennessee, and uh, they played well today. Um, they were the better football team, and um, they they certainly deserve the win today. But um, have to coach this football team better. That's uh, that's the bottom line. I appreciate him saying that because I agree. He does need to be better. Brian Pulley needs to be better too. Mike Denbrock needs to be better too. You no know, play calling. I think I had some questions. I mentioned one on, on one of the fourth down plays. And there were a few, you know, a few calls where was that just bad execution or was that a bad play call? I don't know. I don't know what the play call was. Um, but I think overall, when you look at a, a 40 to 13 loss at home, everyone's culpable. Everyone needs to be better. So I appreciate the accountability from Brian Kelly. But what I need to see moving forward is changes and improvements. That if he's going to say, I need to do a better job coaching, I'd like to see some of, of these coaching changes. I'd like to see the coaching staff, you know, just make better decisions. And to, I'd like for this team to come out more prepared moving forward. Maybe this Tennessee game was a wake-up call that they needed. It was a slap in the face that they needed to say, hey, you know, we still got a lot of work to do. We've done a lot of good. Being 2-1 and one in the SEC at this point, I'll take it. I'm good with that. You know, I kind of expected LSU to be in this position at 4-2. and two after this game anyways. I didn't think that they were going to lose to Florida State, but I, I didn't think that they were going to beat Mississippi State, to be completely honest with you. So, you know, th- the season's not over. There's still a lot to look forward to, but there's also still a lot to work on. So if Brian Kelly is going to take accountability and say, I need to be better, then I need to see him be better. But we've got a Florida game this week. We've got more to look on to. We've got some things that can be worked on. And that's what we'll get into throughout the rest of the week. But that's what we're going to, that's going to do it for me today. Thank you for making Locked on LSU your first listen every day. You can get more on the SEC by making Locked on SEC your second listen. Every day, host Chris Gordy and the local experts of Locked on take you across the SEC in 30 minutes. Make Locked on SEC your second listen.